Hi, Daniel. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm in London. It's miserable, but not nearly as miserable as it is in the place we're going to be talking about. You're, that's a fair assessment. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright, publisher of Non-Zero Newsletter. This is a Non-Zero podcast. You're Daniel Levy, uh, president of the U.S. Middle East Project. I've known you for around 20 years. All of that time, you've been engaged in the Israel-Palestine issue. And in fact, before that, uh, you served uh, in, you, you were involved in negotiations, I think, at both Camp David and Kaaba on the Israeli side. No, you're a citizen of both Israel and, and Britain, is that right? And for all I know, America? Yeah, that's right. And I was involved um, actually during my IDF service in Israel in the talks under Prime Minister Rabin in Oslo B. And then I was kind of in back room in Israel. Camp David, but in the in the, in the negotiating room itself at Taba. Oh, so the the trifecta. Yeah, the, those are actually the the, the three. Uh, a lot of people say the three most hopeful moments of the past several decades: Oslo, Camp David, and Taba. Right. Well, <sighs> Camp David is a strange one, which we may or may not go into. But uh, the but, build up. Yes, it was like okay, we're going yeah. for it. The, the meeting itself was uh, was a bit of a disaster. Let me um, let me uh, let me do some. I want to start by talking about more current events, but let me do some crass self promotion, and we'll get back to Camp David by the end of the conversation. The crass self promotion is: I wrote a piece uh, in two thousand two called "Was Arafat the Problem?" Meaning uh, uh, in Slate, you can Google it. That's the title, uh, arguing that the, that the so-called state offered uh, Palestine wasn't quite as uh, generous an offer as some had said. You're, you're nodding your head. And, and uh, this was after Robert Malley wrote his piece for the New York Review of Books, I think. Uh, exactly. And, and so, um, but maybe we'll get to that. Uh, so a couple of things just this morning, I, I got up and saw that the U.S. Uh, National Intelligence Director has issued uh, her annual report and there were a couple of things. One was that the war in Gaza seems to be arousing and energizing terrorist enemies of the U.S. and Israel around the world. The other was that the Gaza war poses a threat to the Netanyahu government. Um, of course, it was also an opportunity for the, for the Netanyahu government. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, the second issue about the, 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 the current political situation I'm interested in, both because of that assessment and uh, because uh, last week, I think it was, Benny Gantz, political rival of Netanyahu's, came, visited uh, the U.S. He's a member of the War Cabinet, uh, along with Bibi, but a, but a uh, political rival. Apparently, Netanyahu wasn't happy about that, found it threatening. Perhaps that's the way the U.S. administration intended it. I've, I've wondered, um, you know, there are kind of two questions of, about how much power the Biden administration has. One is how much leverage they have to actually bring hostilities to an end. We can, I hope to get to that. But but there's also the question of like, do they have the power to do regime change in effect, uh, to, to unseat uh, Netanyahu with maneuvers like this, I guess, uh, by empowering political rivals or whatever Netanyahu feared was going on here? I would say to that that I can sketch out a scenario uh, that I think is really quite plausible that the Biden administration, any U.S. administration, has um, the ability to bring what is going on in Gaza to a halt, to actually get to uh, a ceasefire, uh, and I believe that is much the most important thing uh, mm -hmm. to be trying to do. I think one could also make a case that they could do um, regime change in Israel. It might be the case that you need to do the latter in order to achieve the former, although I could paint a scenario whereby you wouldn't need to do that. Uh, I think the latter is more difficult uh, to get the, the, the regime, the regime change. change. Uh, yeah, to get the regime change in Israel. Um, I would also say this, the, the, you know, the really burning thing is to bring an end to what's going on in Gaza. Um, 
if that requires regime change, then I think that would be as a consequence, as a byproduct of taking the approach that one needs to bring an end to what's going on in Gaza. I, I, I do think that the idea um, that a Gantz-led administration uh, suddenly opens a vista to all kinds of tremendous peacemaking opportunities is for the birds. It's a pipe dream. That, that's yeah. not the case. I, I mean, he's not that far left to begin with, leaving aside, I gather, on the, on the uh, spectrum of Israeli political actors. But that aside, I, I, the public, uh, you know, I, how much support there would be in the public for any kind of ambitious uh, long-term solution to the problem seems very in doubt. I mean, more in doubt as a result of October 7th, right? Yes, but let's not underestimate how little support there was that for that prior to October 7th either. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Israel has gone on this incremental journey um, in its political life to a place where almost the entirety of the parliamentary Jewish Zionist political spectrum is, I think, I th I th I think the, the most honest word to describe it would be on the apartheid spectrum. Now, there's an extreme wing of that for whom uh, apartheid is, perhaps there's a degree of honesty to this position, that apartheid is not sustainable and what you really need to do is ethnic cleansing. So that's the Ben Gvir Smotrich, and they've been quite open about that, eradication, permanent displacement, uh, a second Nakba, referring to the, the, the physical removal of Palestinians from the territorial expanse. And these are the two kind of ex most extreme members of the cabinet whose names you, you just mentioned. Exactly. So th 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 there's a degree of familiarity now with these names. Uh, the national security slash police minister, Itamar Ben Gvir, um, uh, from the Jewish uh, Power Party and the finance minister, Betzalel Smotrich, and they came together, they ran together and then re-separated into their constituent parts, Smotrich being the religious Zionist party. Um, just in case anyone is, is um, unfamiliar with that detail about these extremists, uh, where did they come together? Where did they form that party in advance of the last election? in Benjamin Netanyahu's home in Caesarea. Uh, Netanyahu was worried Israel's electoral system is a pure proportional representation system, but you need to hit a certain threshold in order to enter parliament. If you're below that threshold, all your votes go to waste. Netanyahu was concerned that some of those far-right votes would go to waste rather than be part of the building blocks for a coalition that he would need. He brings the two to his home in Caesarea. That's where the final deal is sealed. And, and it's just one of the many um, either intentional misreadings or just inabilities to get to grips with uh, the granularity uh, of Israeli politics that the Biden administration has displayed. Um, and so this is where I'd also urge caution in terms of them thinking they can do regime change and them thinking it's terribly smart to invite Mr. Gantz they have so misplayed this in terms of how their policies have impacted uh, domestic Israeli politics that I really wouldn't want to leave anything like that in their hands. And it, it, well, it's almost to me you like they, Can you elaborate on that? What, what have they done wrong? So let's take ourselves back to before October 7th, okay? Okay. Um, because what you had when Netanyahu forms this government uh, and brings in these, these people who, I mean, this is the degree of extremism of, of, yeah. of, and the public statements of Ben Gvir and Smotrich, I, I think is, is, is a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. Yeah, they, you have to. Can I just try out my favorite uh, uh, antidote? Because it blows my mind. One of them, until a couple of years ago, he, and when he was going to get into politics and had to clean up his act a little, had a portrait of Baruch Goldstein in his house. Baruch Goldstein walked into a mosque with a submachine gun. He was a settler extremist uh, in Hebron and gunned down. However, he killed dozens of, of Palestinians. This guy had a just walked in. You know, there was no provocation. He just wanted to slaughter Palestinians uh, in the West Bank. And 
he, this guy had a portrait of him on his wall. I, I, so th- I think that no, was exactly. some time done... in painting, you know, I mean. Yeah, you know, you've done the work for me there. Exactly. And, 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 a, and a little kind of coda to that story of Baruch, Baruch Goldstein, Hebron um, massacre is it is after that that we see the Palestinian deployment of suicide bombings. For the first so this, time. this is right before the second intifada that he did this. No, this is uh, <laughs> this is early on in Oslo. This is significantly okay. before the second intifada. Okay. It's much earlier on, Baruch Goldstein. Okay. So, so these this is uh, Ben Gavir and Swatridge. Now, it, as is their typical modus operandi, the administration sends these kind of oh we don't like these guys. They don't meet with them. But this is part of the coalition. You don't actually treat the governing coalition any differently. The administration has already not reversed in any significant way anything the Trump administration before it did. But not only that, a government of this extremism is fated with yet more American goodies. So I just want people to wrap their heads around this. The government of Netanyahu Ben Gvir Smotrich is the Israeli government which the Biden administration chooses to bestow the visa waiver program. That Israelis no longer need a visa to enter the United States, something every Israeli government had clamored for, had desperately wanted to achieve. Who did they give this to? Ben Gvir Smotrich and Bibi. This is before October 7th? This is before October 7th. Mm-hmm. And this is so despite the have, objections of... Yeah. So they should have uh, dished out some negative reinforcement to the coalition as a whole, the government, uh, uh, rather than, you know, what, what they would say in their defense is, well, you know, since October 7th, we've sanctioned several settlers, you know. And, and they also, I think, said, no, we won't send uh, rifles uh, because we think they'll be redirected towards settlers at some point. I applaud that. Great. But... You're saying it should have started earlier, and and it, and 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 the entire ruling coalition should have been held accountable for having these two guys in it, basically. Yeah. So let let me unpack two things uh, in there. Look, first of all, um, when the Biden administration comes in, uh, Bibi is not yet in power. They're still working with the previous short-lived government led by Naftali Bennett with Gantz. Uh, in the government then with Yair Lapid. That government conspicuously does nothing to advance anything positive. Settlements continue. In fact, it's under that government that intensive military raids into the the, the hearts of the Palestinian West Bank cities resume extraterritorial, ex, sorry, extrajudicial assassinations uh, are resumed by, by that government. They declare um six leading Palestinian NGOs, including the main human rights organization on the Palestinian side, which documents not only Israeli abuses, but also Palestinian authority abuses, uh, an organization by the name of al Haq. Uh, Israel designates those as criminal terrorist entities, and the Americans fail to push back on that. So things aren't looking splendid. And then uh, this very uh, extreme government comes in and There's a bit of kind of verbal acrobatics around not meeting Engavir and Smotrich, but it's business as usual. So the two main planks of the policy, uh, I would suggest, with uh, Bengavir, Smotrich, Netanyahu, are um, pursuing normalization. So if, again, and it's still on, it's, you know, we're still treated to um, a regular... um, with, uh, between, by Tom Friedman, well, yeah, with between Saudi Israel Arabia. and uh, Arab state Saudi Arabia in particular, and we should say that this is a continuation of the Trump uh, Abraham Accords kind of momentum. In retrospect, a lot of people think that uh, this uh, may have been a, uh, a, a maybe the major uh, cause of of October seventh. Certainly, a, an attempt to derail. Uh, what was very threatening to the Palestinians, threatening to Hamas, uh, the idea of normalizing relations with all these Arab states without uh, addressing the Pal- Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, presumably, the planning would have started 
I don't know, during the during the Trump part of it uh, uh, for October 7th, I mean. But Biden chose to continue that without seriously bringing the Palestinian issue into it as a prerequisite, uh, solving that as a prerequisite. Um, and then and then so there we are. Uh, if there's anything about that you want to correct or you disagree with, uh, go ahead. But no, I just want to provide I, that context for people. I, I, I would just double down, actually, on 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 what you pointed out, that um, the Biden administration absolutely continues. It, it gives some, some kind of rhetorical gestures that, hey, there are Palestinians, but it absolutely continues uh, with the uh, Trump policy of, trying to do an end run around the Palestinians with this normalization. They established something called the Negev Forum with the normalized countries. That's under the previous Israeli government. And then the centerpiece, almost the obsession in Middle East policy uh, of the administration becomes this Saudi normalization. Now, I think they're doing it for U.S. geopolitical reasons. Maybe we will or will not come back to that. We won't mm-hmm. go into it now. Um, and you have this constant... Uh, back and forth of visits of Jake Sullivan and Brett McGurk, uh, senior uh, national security uh, officials in the administration to Saudi uh, looking to expand this relationship. Now, by by doing that, I think uh, they, they were sending the signal that Israel can carry on even with this kind of a government uh, making things worse with the Palestinians and will carry on pursuing this regional integration. And of course, people are familiar with the speeches, but also with the famous uh, print version of the Jake Sullivan foreign affairs article, where he's telling us that this is the most peaceful Middle East in generations. And and they're giving speeches in the weeks leading up to October 7th saying, look out for, for you know how we're integrating the region. And the big thing, just prior to October 7th, it, it, it feels like a different uh, universe. But uh, in September, there is the G20 meeting under the then uh, presidency of India, which takes place in Delhi. And on mm-hmm. the sidelines of the G20, there is an announcement made of the India Middle East Europe corridor, which is this idea that you're going to link India, Saudi and the Gulf states, and Israel. Um, And that announcement is made by the Americans. It's chaperoned by the Americans. This is something that that Sullivan and Blinken speak to a lot in in those speeches at that time. They say, look out for IMEC. This is the the, uh, 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 abbreviation. Look out for I2U2, India, Israel, UAE, uh, USA. This is the story of of the future. Netanyahu, at the end of September in the annual UN General Assembly meetings, he stands up. He, he loves his uh, his graphic displays. It's a bit of a genre of Netanyahu when he's speaking at the UN. And he pulls out this map of the new Middle East and those who are moving forward and those who will be left behind. Of course, Palestine is colored as part of Israel, uh, the Palestinian-occupied territories. So that's where we are in terms of the failure of the policy leading into October 7th. They have gone along the line that the Palestinian issue can just be managed at very low cost. They missed an opportunity, and this is something else that I would uh, just point out. They missed an opportunity earlier on. Palestinian elections, there haven't been elections for the Palestinian representative institutions uh, for a decade and a half. Now it's almost more, but at the time... Mm -hmm. They're, they are scheduled to begin in April 2021. Mahmoud mm-hmm. Abbas, hated by his own public, no credibility. People will note that he has barely uh, appeared during the, the most calamitous period for his people. He mm-hmm. indefinitely mm-hmm. postpones, in effect, cancels those elections. And in the lead up, the US had been encouraging the cancellation, postponement of those elections, partly because they were scared that Hamas wouldn't necessarily win, but would be part of a governing formation. If that had happened, mm. I would at least postulate as a as a as a counterfactual. So I you know I can't prove this, but we would not be where we are today if, because yeah. Hamas was looking for a way 
to be integrated, as it has done for many years, into the Palestinian body politic and hand over much of the governance of Gaza, which it is not particularly interested in, uh, to a different Palestinian body. Yeah. Can I one other just... thing I'd say on this, Rob, Bob, let me do one other thing on this, which is those who claim that the Abraham Accords, the normalization, would be a game changer. We've now been able to test this in real time, whether it has impacted stability in the Middle East and how it has impacted the Palestinian-Israeli question over the last more than five months. And we have seen that it has contributed nothing to regional stability and has been at best a sideshow and perhaps uh, an encourager of Israeli extremism. Yeah, on this issue of uh, an opportunity to bring Hamas into a uh, Hamas kind of Palestinian authority, I guess, uh, coalition or whatever you want to call it, that's not technically what it is, uh, that apparently you're saying was maybe missed shortly before October 7th. There's a little deja vu here. Again, I, we won't revisit it, but uh, one more instance of self-promotion. I wrote a piece um, called The Truth About Hamas, revisiting what happened right after the last uh, Hamas elections and the misconceptions about it and what really happened, which was virtually, I think, criminal in terms of what the U.S. in particular did after that, but but also what 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 Israel did in uh, in in trying to keep at all costs, you know, Palestinian governance in, in essence divided. Uh, so that so that there wouldn't uh, there wouldn't be they wouldn't have to talk seriously about two state or anything else. Um, the okay, so yeah, the the um, so there were mistakes made before October seventh. Uh, I think even Biden would say, uh, well, maybe he would say maybe he shouldn't have embraced uh, Netanyahu so tightly right after October seventh. But to bring it up to right now. If you were, if you could just magically control the Biden administration, and I assume you would like to uh, to do the the you know uh, the, these two outcomes that you say are kind of closely related, um, bringing hostilities to a halt and unseating uh, the Netanyahu coalition. If you if you were to try to do either, or I guess in a certain sense, ideally both of those. <laughs> Um, what would you what would you start doing right now that's just different from what Biden is doing, or what is he doing right? Uh, for all I know, no, no, that, that, that that's a really uh, short yeah, conversation. We can skip that part, okay? Yep. Uh, no, I I I don't want to be glib. I I, I genuinely think, uh, and I don't know where why. Uh, I can make some guesses, but I genuinely think this has been handled in a horrible way, uh, in a deeply counterproductive way unless they have an interest in uh, in going from plausible genocide to to an actual finding of genocide in terms of what is happening to the Palestinians. Um, I do not know whether it is a consequence that when you know that the policy framework in which you're operating is so constrained because you're not willing to challenge Israel in meaningful ways that you therefore start doing things which are extremely unlikely to produce serious outcomes. Um, but you, you kind of tell yourself, well, this is the best chance we've got. So what, um, what could they do? Uh, uh, it's a crucial question. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to make my life easy, uh, by suggesting that, look, one phone call, Biden clicks his finger and this is done. I, I don't think mm -hmm. that's the case, actually. What I think they could do. Uh, is the following, and I want to acknowledge up front that my assessment is that it would probably require a sustained standoff with the Israeli leadership. Mm -hmm. If you go down this path, you have to be willing to be in an uncomfortable um, interaction with Netanyahu and others in that leadership over a period of time. I don't, I don't think it would take that long, at least until I've got to stop to this. And the, the key thing, I would say, is you make the policy fight about hostage release and ceasefire, getting that deal done. Let me stay on this for a moment. And yeah, and get into the details a little because there's a, a perception in American media, and I have no idea wh who's right, but. Uh, 
that Hamas is the problem. I mean, it, it seems to be certainly the case that there's not a meeting of minds here and Hamas is demanding more than they're being given. Uh, but, you know, the, the presentation by the administration is, OK, there's a deal on the table. And now we just have to see if, if Hamas accepts it. It's kind of like negotiations generally, where the U.S. says, OK, there's an Israeli deal on the table. It's the Palestinians' fault if it's not accepted. But, but I don't know the details here. And is it your sense that uh, some of the media presentation suggests uh, that this guy Sinwar, the, the, the leader in Gaza uh, of Hamas, has just calculated that, that there's enough uh, opposition to the Netanyahu policy building that uh, all he has to do is wait and will not do any kind of hostage deal at all. And ultimately, uh, this will be catastrophic uh, for Israel if Netanyahu persists. So kind of like bring it on if you want to try. And, and, and the perception is uh, he's willing to abide any amount of carnage uh, and clearly, I, I think he is willing to abide a lot of Palestinian deaths, although I'm not sure he, he anticipated this many when he launched this operation on October 7th. Anyway, uh, can, can you can, can you really start like kind of right there? In other words, you do think there is a deal that is doable by your reading of the signals from both sides and everything. You could get a hostage deal that ended hostilities. So let me get into that. The points about Sinwar, I would just caveat uh, by saying, um, A, he, I don't think one can overpersonalize it around him. There is a decision-making structure uh, mm. of which I would suggest um, it would be a mistake to overestimate his primus inter pares uh, in, role. Including, including the guys not in Gaza. So you think they, they have real... The, the politi they have some political say. leadership, ultimate yeah, political they have leadership. The, you have the external exiled political okay. leadership. You have the leadership in Gaza. Um, you have the Politburo, the, the Shura Council um, okay. of Hamas. The I, I think he, Sinwar and others would say um, this is, and yeah, I, I don't want to suggest that they, they are um, you know, doing what's best for everyone in Gaza. I think that that, that is not a, a right. credible claim. I think they would say that um, this is what a people has to go through. Look at the losses the Algerians sustained to achieve their freedom. Look at the losses the Vietnamese sustained to achieve their freedom, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think we have to just simply acknowledge uh, that they have far more credibility um, for having taken on Israel uh, than other Palestinian actors and certainly than mm -hmm. the uh, American-backed uh, uh, folks who are seen as complicit and working hand-in-hand -hand with the Israelis uh, mm -hmm. in Ramallah in the West Bank. Um, and there, the it would be a mistake to suggest that negotiations with Hamas are easy, and I'm not about to suggest that. And one can't you know, skip over what happened on October 7th. One has to hold uh, at the same moment the three things, that the reality that existed before October 7th, a permanent Palestinian dispossession, structural violence against the Palestinians, a regime credibly uh, meet meeting the legal definition of apartheid. That really matters. You can't understand things without that. October mm -hmm. 7th, violations of international law are committed since October 7th. And right in the day one, the Israelis come out with the collective punishment of Palestinian civilians, no food, fuel, water, electricity, and the crimes committed by Israel since October 7th. One has to keep those all in mind. But when it comes to this negotiation, Hamas is not going to uh, agree to step down, release the hostages at any price, despite what is happening in uh, in Gaza. Anyone who suggests that they will do so has apparently never read uh, any history, not only in, in the Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli Hamas talks, but of any uh, kind of resistance to uh, uh, to a belligerent occupation. 
it, yeah, it seems to me to put a finer point. I mean, I, I've always thought there's kind of no way unless their backs are against the wall in a way they're not. Uh, like they face the prospect of all the entire like uh, military leadership dying or something, and including Sinwar. Um, barring that, I've always thought they're 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 just not going to give up all the hostages until there's a, what they see as an enduring settlement. It, it's not like it's not like okay well, so for for six weeks of peace. We'll give you all the all of our bargaining chips and then have at us. Of course not. And there seems to be in some corners almost an expectation of that. Now, I don't mean anyone high up in the administration is that naive. But anyway, I, I assume like this is part of the issue. Um, yes. And, 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 and the backdrop to what you're saying is that there is not sufficient attrition on the battlefield, in the balance of forces for either right. party to say, OK, look, Hamas right. has taken a hit but they have shown resilience. Israel right. has not done spectacularly on the battlefield. It, it has caused a lot of, uh, of self-harm, and Hamas is, is, Hamas is banking on that. When you mm -hmm. know that the other party is much more powerful, has much more to lose, that's asymmetrical warfare. And Israel has fallen straight into that trap. The level of destruction, yeah. the statements that have come out of the Israelis, the actions that they have taken, is, Israel has lost this war. I think we, we, you know, one just has to acknowledge that. Now, given that the balance of forces, narrowly speaking, on the battlefield is not going to lead to a capitulation uh, by either side, one goes to the mediation, the talks that have been ongoing successfully. Those talks in late November secured the release of 100 plus Israeli hostages. There were eight days of quiet. There were some Palestinian prisoners released from Israeli jails. But then, as Netanyahu committed to doing, the, um, the Israeli military action resumed. That deal, mm -hmm. by the way, has been on the table. The deal of, and this, the, the Hamas aren't holding these hostages for no reason. They're not justified, but they are holding them as, as uh, in order, and some of them are soldiers. Uh, in order to get Palestinians released from Israeli jails, which has happened in the past. And the deal has been available really since week four. Week you mean a, four. Deal that would have, a deal that would have done what has been okay. available? It would have ended permanent ceasefire, um, hostages out, um, the terms for reorganizing, kind of, kind of reorganizing Israel's withdrawal from Gaza, the conditions in the Gaza, uh, and the release of Palestinian prisoners. Now, that looks different today because the degree of devastation, the humanitarian needs um, as a result of Israel's largely indiscriminate uh, actions in, in, in urban terrain uh, look different today to how they look then. Now, so th this is a deal that would have, well, left Hamas intact. They could have uh, declared victory, I guess, in principle, which is one thing Israel wouldn't like. But, but when you say it was available, I mean, what are the terms? What what would okay, it so have that, involved? Right. So the, the, the terms uh, uh, have shifted. Now, you know, Hamas is not intact. Uh, the uh, you know, Netanyahu says October 7th should never be repeated. Uh, of the three things, um, and of course, one wouldn't want to see October 7th repeated, but of the three things that will guarantee October 7th is never repeated, uh, I would argue the military operation against Hamas is the least significant. So I think the first thing to secure the non-repetition of October 7th is mm -hmm. that you no longer are keeping Palestinians in those conditions without their rights, without their freedoms, uh, living under an apartheid regime. The second thing is you never have an Israeli military that is so focused on defending and advancing the cause of the settlers in the West Bank that is so full of hubris and arrogance that is, it is ill-prepared in terms of its military intelligence, in terms of its deterrence, in terms of its immediate military reaction. The third thing is, what is the stat, the, the, the capacity of Hamas? The capacity of Hamas uh, has been impacted. Now, since the effort to put together a second package after the collapse of the first pause, that was upgraded. As, as people will be familiar, you saw Bill Burns, the head of the CIA, getting engaged. You had this format where the prime minister of Qatar and his negotiating team, the head of Egyptian intelligence, Burns, the head of the CIA, 
and the head of the Israeli Mossad and other is senior Israeli security personnel have been meeting. Now, a paper comes out of that that was then tweaked and, and, and worked with uh, and refined in a meeting in Paris uh, last month. That paper goes into a degree of detail. And what it does is it sets out three phases in which the non-male combatants who are being held in Gaza would be the first phase of the release, and I'll come back to that. Second phase is the male combatants. Third phase is, is the bodies of Israelis who, uh, whether in the attack on October 7th, whether at the hands of Israeli airstrikes, uh, are no longer alive. Mm -hmm. In each of those phases, there will be releases of Palestinian prisoners. At the end of that, there's a permanent ceasefire. What they have subsequently done is gone into significant detail. I've seen the bridging proposal. It's not a bridging proposal, though. It's, it's America working with Israel on the proposal, unfortunately, which is something we're used to in other contexts. So there's significant detail there, Bob, on exactly where would Israeli military forces be deployed? What would be the key, the ratio of Palestinian prisoners released in exchange for the Israelis in the first phase? Mm -hmm. What Under what terms could humanitarian assistance get in, the extent of that humanitarian assistance? Under what terms could Palestinians return to the north of Gaza during uh, this pause? Uh -huh. Where we are is that Hamas has responded to what is essentially an Israeli-American proposal. Um, Israel has not then responded to that response. Now, there's an issue. So Hamas has, a, has put a deal on the table that they would I accept? I don't, I don't want to say that Hamas has said um, these are the exact terms, but they have given their responses. Now, the understanding on the part of all of those involved, including people who have, have, who have spoken to members of the Israeli war cabinet, is that there is a zone for an agreement. The main... Look, there's, a, there's a major fault line, and then there are details. The major fault line is, the Israeli side is saying this can only be a pause. It cannot be a permanent ceasefire. Netanyahu, as we have heard frequently, mm -hmm. his commitment mm -hmm. is war will continue. We mm -hmm. will attack Rafa. Now, by yeah. saying that, he's undermining the talks from the get. -go. The Hamas position right. is this must be the on-ramp to a guaranteed permanent ceasefire. However, what we have at the moment is there is a willingness on the Hamas side, for there to be ambiguity in that question of how locked in is the permanent ceasefire and the full Israeli withdrawal. So there is an opportunity to have a deal where the things that now get thrashed out are those details I mentioned. How much humanitarian aid gets in? What are the guarantees for it getting in? Uh, what are the terms for Palestinians to return to the north of Gaza? Um, what is the ratio of prisoners uh, who mm -hmm. are being held by Israel in exchange for um, the Israelis being held in Gaza. And the US, and, and this is the crucial, one of the two crucial things to wrap one's head around. The US has a choice, and I recognize it's not an easy choice. Either you can play your usual game and say, the Israelis have put forward a reasonable position. The Palestinians have rejected it. Now, I recognize it's even harder to do, do that where the Palestinian side is Hamas. And America seems just unwilling to go to that place mm -hmm. where it acknowledges that there's a reasonable position. I, I say this um, with caution, but, but the, the facts seem to back this up, that there is a more reasonable position being put forward by Hamas than being put forward by Prime Minister Netanyahu. You wouldn't have to say it like that, by the way. I think what the administration could do would be to put forward a genuine bridging proposal. Yeah. In terms of what are the parameters for a deal. Now, Netanyahu has said Hamas so, is not So kind invested. of go public. Because let me say by analogy, I've always thought that, that the way to actually do a two-state solution back when it seemed possible, leaving aside the question of whether it is now or ever will be, was for the U.S. 
rather than go to Israel and put something on the table and say, more or less, take it or leave it with very minor adjustment, do the opposite. Find something that would work for the Palestinians. And of course, this assumes no polit domestic political strengths in America, but indulge the thought experiment and say, um, we think this is reasonable. Here are the specifics. And uh, we just can't continue to support Israel in the way we have if they don't think it's reasonable. I mean, that's so far from being conceivable and by conventional American political reckoning. But anyway, you're, you're kind of talking about something similar. In other words, get a sense for what would work from the Palestinian side and to some extent actually lay it out there and embrace it. And, and uh, uh, the reason I would argue that, that if they want to see an end to this, and I, you know, I can't say, given how they've behaved with confidence, that the administration does want to see an end to this. But let's uh, go with that thought experiment as well. If they wanted to see an end to this, I think that would be the way to go, to put something forward. Now, Netanyahu has said, and America seems ready to play that blame game rather than get a deal done, but Hamas is uninterested. In the Israeli papers, an Israeli correspondent, Ben Kaspit, has quoted a war cabinet minister as saying Netanyahu's depiction of the talks, and I'm quoting here, is a series of lies. Now, America has a choice. The Biden administration has a choice. Does it want to back up Bibi's blame game series of lies, or does it want to put forward a position? And even when Kamala Harris, the Veep, uh, made that speech in Selma, which was like, oh, look, they're shifting tone, she continued. She continued to be in the blame game business. And in the, okay. she said, see, immediately it's like four, six weeks. Now, why do I say this is the crucial terrain on which to work? Because I think if the administration did that, then you unleash a very hard to manage internal dynamic in Israel. Mm -hmm. In the military, many of whom think they need to get this deal done. Many of whom, by the way, acknowledge that there's an exhaustion uh, on the part of the uh, Israeli forces. They sent home some of the reservists. They have not called them up again. They cannot do rougher, not because of anything America is saying, but because they are not militarily in a position to deploy. It doesn't mean they won't be in a few weeks. They will be if this is allowed to continue. But you will have the military divided and I think erring more on the side of supporting the deal. You will have the war cabinet divided. You will have the public divided, you will see, I think, an escalation in what already has been a shift in the willingness to protest that we have seen in the last three weeks inside Israel. So I think you, rather than doing the things that the administration has done, which is name calling and expressing mm -hmm. disappointment and frustration and talking about the day after, by the way, the administration has said, Bibi, you need to accept that there's going to be two states after this. You need to accept that the Palestinian Authority is coming in. Bibi, you're wasting the opportunity to have a deal with Saudi Arabia and normalization. On all of those fronts, Bibi wins. Bibi wins. He's not put under domestic pressure. On this, he would be under serious pressure if, and this is the crucial second piece, and this is why the, the administration could, if they pursued this, I think they'd have their best shot at getting to a different place. If at the same time, they were willing to use the most crucial piece of leverage that they have, which is, of course, the provision of arms, ordinances, the weaponry, uh, without which this can continue. So, I will so, quote, uh, let me quote one thing here. Uh -huh. The lead correspondent in the Sheldon Adelstein founded uh, Israel Hayom uh, newspaper. We you should say Sheldon Adelson, far right, no longer alive, uh, no longer American, alive. Is, Israel supporter, big con uh, contributor to Trump and other uh, Republicans who once seriously advocated dropping a nuclear bomb in the Iranian desert to, quote, show them we mean business. Uh, not exactly. during hostilities, just to say, just as a reminder. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so the quote from this, from their lead correspondent on all of this, Yoav Limor, Without Biden's support, Israel would long ago have been forced to stop the fighting in Gaza due to a shortage of weapons. Uh -huh. We now know from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times that they have done 100 small transfers in order to avoid accountability and scrutiny by Congress. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to put that on the table, as the United States government, 
Don't tell me that you don't want to see another 30,000 dead. Don't tell the supporters and the voters in Michigan or anywhere else in the country that you want to see an end to this because you're not putting on the table the thing that could stop this. And the Israeli military would, under those circumstances, if they do both of those things, I think Bibi has an almost impossible choice to make. And like I said, Bibi may say no on day one, but if they're willing to sustain this standoff, then I think Bibi has to find a way out of this. It doesn't necessarily involve regime change. And as far as I'm concerned, that's secondary. End the killing and get the humanitarian assistance into Gaza. That's the key thing. Okay. So first of all, uh, figure out a deal that would work for the Palestinians and who's vending hostilities enduringly. Um, actually embrace it and communicate to Israel in some credible way, which might mean saying it publicly. You tell you me. You have to. You, you have, have to, to say, say we will end the weapons flow publicly. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I think they, they, have to, they could be clear on what they're not sending. I mean, they should never have sent these 2,000-pound right. bombs to be used in the way they were. But part right. of that, they have to be very clear. And, and Israel, Israel simply won't be able to continue. Now, Bibi will then have to navigate. I don't think he's going to change his coalition. I think he will find a way of navigating this and moving into a different phase. By the way, you have to send strong messages on the north as well. Uh, vis-a-vis Hezbollah and Lebanon, because mm. this would be a dangerous moment also in terms of uh, Netanyahu perhaps seeking to continue the war there. Okay. Uh, so that's a very valuable thing to to hear from you. I haven't heard it put uh, quite like that by anyone. Um, so this is the, uh, we're approaching the end of the public part of the podcast. Thanks to everybody who stuck with us. If you want to hear uh, the rest of this conversation, I want to elaborate a little on that, on the scenario you've sketched out, um, get into the question of whether ultimately there is, you know, some hope can come out of a, a deeply traumatic event like October 7th, which is an argument some have made. Um, and uh, maybe maybe revisit the Camp David thing, as we said, uh, we might. But if you want to hear uh, the rest of the conversation, all you have to do is become a paid subscriber to the Non-Zero Newsletter. Um, go to non-zero at Substack or click a link in your uh, Substack, uh, your uh, podcast app show notes. It's also a way of just supporting the kinds of conversations we have here. But in any event, thanks for uh, sticking with us this long. And now we will head into overtime.